Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa salatu wa salam ala rasul kareem. This is Sister Catherine and welcome to the conclusion of an atheist journey to Islam. Um, this has been a series, I think this would be part seven, something like that. Basically my journey, the process that brought me into Islam. And this episode, we're going to kind of talk about the big epiphany. <laughs> so the series, this will continue in another form afterwards. Inshallah, I want to transition this into sort of a hypothetical Q&A where I'm addressing a lot of the questions that I run into frequently from sisters who are coming from a background of atheism or the like. Um, a lot of the big issues that I struggled with early on. There weren't many, but there's a few big ones, um, issues around Qatar, uh, that sort of thing. So the series will continue. So inshallah, like and subscribe, and uh, you can follow along as we look at all these questions. So today, I want to start with a, a verse from the Quran. A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim bismillahi rahman rahim Allah says in the Quran, chapter 17, verse 81, and say, truth has now arrived, and falsehood perish, for falsehood batil is by its nature bound to. Um, this verse really resounds in my soul <laughs> now. Uh, the first times I read it, I sort of glossed over it as, you know, just, just stating the obvious, right? Truthhood, you know, is here. Uh, truth outdoes falsehood. I mean, yeah, obviously, right? I mean, how would truth not clarify and destroy untruth? Um, but this verse and the many, many like it in the Quran have a much deeper resonance for me now. So at this point in my journey, uh, we've come through my first, my first real awareness of Islam as something distinct from the other kind of Abrahamic faiths and the other Oriental faiths. Um, to use a very outdated term. Um, uh, we've come through my first reading of the English translation of the Quran, commentary, a few of the big verses that struck me. Um, now we're here, here's me, you know, in having completed the Quran, I found it a beautiful, logical, boundlessly deep text with just, you know, massive amounts of, of knowledge to, to offer. I've been studying it. I've started a second or third read, to, read through at this point. I've, I've gotten a hold of a different translation that I'm reading for contrast. I've been listening to lectures. I'm reading Sira, which is kind of the stories of the, the lifetime of the Prophet and his companion, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And um, I've kind of started immersing myself into the culture of Islam and absorbing as much of that as I can. But at this point, up until the very moment that we're going to look at, I was still very much an atheist. Um, the book was beautiful, but I hadn't gotten past that point. Um, and I was, I was a very frustrated atheist by this point um, because it seemed that I had yet again found a beautiful concept that would lead me nowhere. And in six months, I would be on to the next thing, you know, maybe Taoism. I had I had picked up a book on Taoism around this time, you know, it was on the in the queue, <laughs> which I always had five or six books kind of waiting to to, to get into. Um, so we come to me in my little apartment, you know, stacked to the ceiling with various books on philosophy and religion and old school horror and sci fi and whatever else. I'm sitting, I'm having a chat with a friend over coffee. This friend happens to be a non-practicing Muslim. And obviously, as everyone was, was very aware I was an atheist because I, I didn't usually let that slip past in conversation past a certain point. So this friend has been taking some philosophy classes at the university they intend. This is a subject of interest to me. So we're chatting about what they were kind of going over in the material at that point. These are intro to philosophy classes. And so it's taking me back to kind of the basics. Um, we're discussing object, uh, objectivity and subjectivity as it pertains to morality, moral objectivity and subjectivity as just general concepts. Now, seemingly out of the blue, this friend asks me, 
do you truly not believe in right and wrong? You know, good and bad, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, for one of the very rare times in my life, this kind of struck me into silence. Uh, obviously, I had kind of danced around this topic before. I'm an atheist and an anti-religionist at that point. Uh, my hobby was just destroying faith wherever I found it, just picking it apart, primarily Christian faith, and, and just decimating it, just, just picking it all apart, uh, you know. So I, I, as an atheist, I've lived my life till this moment pushing the premise that morality is inherently subjective. After all, we are, you know, we're all a product of nothing more than chemical and mechanical processes. There is no uniting force for morality to drive an objective concept of morality in the universe, right? I mean, from a purely evolutionary standpoint, it's nonsensical. You know, Dostoevsky summed it up nicely when he said, if God doesn't exist, everything is permissible. Um, so, you know, I'm running through a, a lot of devil's advocacy counter arguments in my own head. Uh, and all the arguments I'd used in the past to defend the position, but I sort of came to a standstill uh, faced with the wall of my own personal belief, because this was a question about me. This wasn't a hypothetical. Typically in these debates, it's how can one not believe in moral objectivism? Well, when it's phrased that way, that's, I can very simply explain to you how one, one cannot believe, one cannot accept the concept of moral objectivism. And I can still explain that to you today. But I guess somehow I had gotten through 20 plus years of my life without directly being asked myself if I believed in moral objectivism. Um, and I was, you know, encountered this wall, this my own personal knowing that it's just it's just not true that that human beings know right from wrong that every adult with full mental capacity on this planet knows that murder is wrong. Every competent adult knows there are some basic universal goods and evils. We all have this awareness of this dichotomy. We are all aware of it in the world around us. And that put me to a very uncomfortable question which was why. And we touched on this a little bit in, in the earlier talk about the problem of evil. Again, I was a master at devil's advocacy. I can argue for any position. I've been told many times that I should have been a lawyer. I can argue I have a skill and ability to argue from any position if you ask me a hypothetical. But this was me, you know, asking me, do I believe that all morality is truly subjective? And no, I realized for the first time in my life with it pared down to just that simple question, do you really believe all morality is subjective? All morality is based on your perception and your experiences. And it forced me to realize that I don't. And that forced me to ask myself, why do I not believe that? Why do I know that that's not correct? This wasn't a hypothetical. This wasn't some abstract point I was arguing from. Um, and there is no real way to articulate the feeling that I had in that moment. Uh, this whole inter internal dialogue took a microsecond, obviously. You know, it felt like a lot longer than that in my head. Um, in that microsecond, I felt something. It was like a cross, it was like a cross between a light switch flipping on and illuminating this just vast space of reality that I had been sitting in in the dark my whole life and just not realized the expanse of it and, and becoming aware of the fact 
that you aren't alone in a room anymore. That's the only way I can try and articulate this sensation. I became fully aware of God in that moment. <laughs> and uh, I can't even say I started believing in God because that's not how it felt. God was there the entire time, obviously. Somehow I had just missed it. <laughs> you know, his God's just incredible unlimited vastness and all-encompassingness it's like god was just too big for me to see and take in um and and still is obviously but it was like it was like you know when a child discovers the sky is maybe how i could explain it um and so that night i started researching <laughs> like i like i always research everything how to become a Muslim, you know, and I anticipated a process. It turned out to be pretty simple. I found, you know, transliteration of the Shahada and I practiced it for a couple days, you know, listened to it in a few different, from a few different people. I was kind of researching, do I have to go to a masjid? Do I have to have witnesses to do this? Because I was just not a social person. I wasn't ready. I, I didn't feel qualified to go and be with other Muslims, I think was part of it. I, I, I didn't want to go without any information. I didn't want to go as, as the one who was just all questions and no answers. I've never been comfortable with being, with being the least informed person in a room. Uh, that's a, a, an issue I struggled with big time. Um, so I finally came to a place where I was confident I can pronounce these words. Ashadu and la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu rasulullah. So I sit down with my laptop one night and I'm, you know, I'm ready. I put on my like target scarf or whatever I had managed to find. Um, and just kind of like, you know, put it in place with some safety pins from my sewing kit. And I sit down with my laptop to say the shahada. And then I felt kind of like an idiot because I realized, you know, I've actually been saying this for like days at this point in my head, it's kind of saying it over and over, trying to memorize it and get it just right. But saying it out loud felt somehow important. It's kind of like putting it out there into the universe and, and making it a reality. So I did. Um, I, you know, I said my shahada in front of my MacBook <laughs> by myself. And then I sent an email to my boss at work at the time telling him, you know, hey, I'm Muslim now. I'm going to be wearing a scarf on my head along with my uniform. And, and that was it. You know, I showed up at work. The next day I worked uh, a Muslim to everyone's <laughs> shock. Um, alhamdulillah, it's been almost 10 years. This was November 11th of 2011 that I said my shahada. It's been almost 10 years since this epiphany, this, you know, literal light bulb moment. And alhamdulillah, I've grown and I've learned a lot. I have exponentially more to learn. Inshallah, Allah will keep me on this earth so I can continue to grow. And inshallah, my story can help someone. Um, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Anbiya, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem, Bismillahi Rahmanir Rahim. Nay, we hurl the truth against falsehood, and it knocks out its brain, and behold, falsehood doth perish. Woe be to you for the false things you ascribe. This verse is very profound because that strange seeming phase in the middle there can be translated a lot of different ways. Uh, the word used is fayad maguhu. Um, and the direct translation would be, it breaks its head. <laughs> so it's a phrase that implies not just physical destruction, destruction of the honor as well as the intellect of a thing, an absolute kind of destruction that brings a thing low, that makes it lowly. This is another one of those words, like we talked about in the in the previous talk on, on abiogenesis and the Big Bang, that only occurs once in the Quran. And there's no coincidence here. You know, falsehood is an illusion. 
It is a, it is a finite, subjective thing. Truth doesn't just erase it. It decimates it. It destroys it utterly. It, it, it breaks it open and exposes the rot inside. And subhanAllah, that is what Allah did for me. He brought me around just kind of step by step, baby steps out of that metaphorical cave of ignorance until I was ready to quite literally see the light. And now this is not in the platonic staring directly into the sun sense, but in the Quranic sense of, of just opening the eyes and ears that I already had and not blocking them and taking in the signs and the majesty all around me that I had just been too dazzled to really process before. So I, you know, I make dua that Allah guides us all to Sirat al Nusqim, and um, you know Ramadan is coming tomorrow, inshallah. Um, so we will have. I will be doing a series. I'll continue this series with addressing topics from the atheist versus theist standpoint and trying to kind of elaborate on these concepts from my former perspective and from having the ability to kind of still see things from that perspective um, and also to clarify you know the confusion that, that people are having to the ummah to people who are trying to reach these people um, and we'll be doing another talk a series on Surah Al-Fatiha throughout Ramadan inshallah we just lost the sunshine um, so inshallah like and subscribe again Jazakallah khair for watching for for joining me on this journey and may we all benefit from it inshallah assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh